Well, classic for me, I brought a, uh, a first date to a very abrupt end recently <laughs> when I made the very basic observation that chiropractics and acupuncture are largely based on the placebo effect. My date took considerable umbrage to this claim and launched into quite a speech about several things she believes in passionately that are not rooted in science. Not that I like to turn to health insurance companies as arbitrators of reality, but uh, there is a reason why they won't pay for visits to a chiropractor or an acupuncturist or a hypnotist or for supplements for much the same reason that they won't pay for you to visit a witch doctor, a palm reader, an astrologer, a fortune teller, or a psychic. And I don't say that to be incredulous or insulting, but there is a lot of hard science behind physical therapy, behind osteopathy, but a lot of what passes for holistic treatments are effective only when the patient believes they are effective. History is full of examples of virtual snake oil treatments that are enjoying popularity uh, for a period of time, but people eventually stop believing in them and they pass into the pages of history. Johann Hari introduces his book, Lost Connections, by talking about a 18th century Connecticut doctor, uh, Elisha Perkins, who noted that when he was extracting a tooth, if he put one of his metal instruments on the, on the socket, that it temporarily relieved the pain. As one historian said, he then added two and two together and regrettably came up with five he invented and very successfully marketed a metal wand that he called a tractor because when he waved it over a painful part of the body, he could then pull the pain out. People everywhere, especially in the days following the Revolutionary War when there were lots of injuries and wounds, fell for the tractor. George Washington had two of them. He claimed that pain was disembodied energy that could be attracted by the wand and pulled out of your body. The miracle cure was so popular that it began to spread to England, and there a fairly cynical physician in Bath, Dr. John Haygarth, disguised a wooden stick to make it look like one of the metal tractors and found that it had exactly the same degree of success. Eventually, people realized that though the pain temporarily was relieved, that it almost always came back, and that the cure had nothing to do with the wand. Now, to this woman's credit, who's at the center of this story, she did take the time to research what I had said to her and got back to me and told me that she discovered that I was right. I'm sure I'm not alone in this when I tell you that that is music to my ear. <laughs> but I was also able to say to her that the more important misunderstanding in our first conversation was that when she heard me say that these things were based on a placebo effect, that that was a bad thing. I did not say that, and I don't think that. Here is a very important point. The placebo effect is proof that you have the ability to heal yourself. The placebo effect is proof that your mind has the ability to control pain. As a physician friend of mine has been fond of saying for years, if you catch a cold, it'll probably take you about three weeks to wear it down. But if you go see your doctor, you'll likely get better in about 21 days. <laughs> Glad you all were able to do that math. Everybody doesn't get that. <laughs> Athletes are notorious for falling for these fad supplements and techniques. A few years ago during the Summer Olympics, you might remember having seen circular bruises on several of the swimmers and divers who were engaging in, in a technique called cupping, which is basically putting a vacuum cleaner on parts of your body to increase circulation, cause circular bruises, I don't know. The point being, if you think that wearing magnets or wearing copper fibers 
or putting tape on your skin somehow affects the joints and muscles underneath. If you think that helps you, then it helps you. I'm just saying that it helps you because you believe it, which should be reassuring to you that your mind is capable of controlling your pain and your illnesses. To be completely clear, a whole lot of what prescription medications and medical treatments, including a lot of surgeries, which are all covered by insurance, they also often work in much the same way. Not to alienate every fan I've ever had, but all of the SSRI, serotonin drugs, antidepressant drugs, work in about the same way that that magic feather that Dumbo holds to fly with works. And that's not me saying that. That's the conclusions of a study done uh, at Harvard Medical School by Dr. Irving Kirsch. SSRIs work absolutely equally as well as a sugar pill, except for the fact that they have terrible side effects. A lot of medications work, a lot of psychological counseling works because the client or the patient believes that someone is taking their pain seriously, that someone cares, that someone is trying to help. It is the caring connection to another person that contains most of the beneficial help. In treat treatment of addiction, Nothing has been proven to work better than AA meetings, and they're not run by professionals, and they're not billed to insurance. You simply build connections with other people sitting across from the table who care whether you're sober or not. And that proves to be the most effective treatment for addiction that we know. But again, to say that it is placebo or psychosomatic is not a bad thing. We've got to get to a point of seeing what a good thing that really is. If you have meaningful and healthy connections to family members, and unfortunately, the most important being to a life partner, which most of us do not have, but, but if you've got a meaningful, mutually supportive relationship with a significant other, with family members, if you are engaged in meaningful work or meaningful volunteerism, and if you spend time in nature, it is unlikely that you will need very much of what they sell at Walgreens. Now, there are exceptions, of course, and the fact remains, as you've heard me say before, the mortality rate is 100%. So you can be the most centered, mentally healthy person in the whole world, and you're still going to die. Though, for example, Gandhi died after someone shot him. And being shot will accelerate the aging process like you wouldn't believe. That, that kind of skews the average. One of the most common questions I get from our listeners online who watch our videos or read my books is this fairly incredulous inquiry. I've had several questions about this just in the past week. So you don't believe in prayer? Well, now that's about as far from the truth as possible. It's true that for me, praying is not presenting my wish list to a supernatural deity in the clouds. That's Santa Claus. I, I think you should not confuse God with Santa Claus. The kind of prayer that I'm interested in is what Soren Kierkegaard is talking about when he says, prayer changes the one who prays, not the one you pray to. Meditation, at least in my use of the term, means to concentrate on an idea or a thing. And contemplation means to try to achieve uh, an internal silence in order to existentially and mindfully connect with nature, connect with my own body, to enhance my awareness of my breath, the food that I eat, and the path beneath my feet. I always counsel people who are struggling with depression to make sure that they walk vigorously outside for at least 30 minutes a day. I think I have to battle depression more than most people do, so I try to walk outside for two hours a day, every day. And I think of that as my meditation or my contemplative time. It is my prayer time. But beyond my own spiritual perspective on this, it's a matter of medical and psychological science that a regular dose of exposure to nature 
is good for us physically and mentally. I mean, it's, it's good to exercise, but being on a stationary bike is nothing like being on a bike trail or walking on a treadmill is nothing like walking outdoors. Being exposed to nature is an important part of it. In fact, last year, Scotland instituted a practice in which physicians can literally prescribe exposure to nature as a medical treatment. They now send out suggestions and examples of experiences in nature for different seasons and different places in Scotland. The objective truth is my favorite meeting ground for science, medicine, psychology, and religion. And this is clearly one of the best examples of this. Japanese doctors call it prescribing a forest bath. And they aren't talking about those Cialis ads with bathtubs in the woods. <laughs> they simply mean spending time in nature. Literally hugging a tree can affect your mood and your psychological well-being. But as regards contemplative prayer, internal silence is, is actually quite difficult to achieve. You, you literally have to practice to be able to do it. But the largest reason for doing it is that there is always another side to the coin when you're talking about a placebo effect. Just as it is true that you have the ability to heal yourself, your mind has the ability to cure you in most instances. Your mind also has the ability to make you very sick or even to kill you. One of my professors at Vanderbilt, the late Liston Mills, used to tell us, you may think that a witch doctor has no power, but there are incidents in which a witch doctor can invoke a curse, break a chicken bone, and point it in a man, and the man will instantly drop dead. Now, in Western medicine, we would say that that person had a heart attack, but for that guy, the witch doctor had the power to kill him through a curse. The reason that we teach meditation, David and I have talked about it so much, I've written about it and lately published about it, is that for reasons which seem to be horribly contrary to evolutionary logic, that if we leave our mind to its own devices, our brain will seem to automatically gravitate to things that will kill us. Kill us slowly, perhaps, through torturous memories of faithless friends, heartbreaking endings to love relationships, missed opportunities, unjust endings, and tragic mistakes that we've made in the past. Now, I've lived here in Springfield for 28 years, most of my adult life, right here in the Queen of the Ozarks. But for no apparent reason, the other night, as I was trying to get still and go to sleep, a memory came back to me of, of a, an insult that I received more than 30 years ago when I was living in Louisville, Kentucky. I was a young pastor in, in a church, and this real jerk of a guy, for no apparent reason, pretending to just be talking to a friend, but saying it loud enough for the 20 people in the room to hear, called me an obscene name. The two men got a big laugh out of it. They, they'd been able to put me down in public, and you know my hands were tied behind me. There was nothing I could do about it. But all these years later, 35 years later, I'm remembering this, my face flushed red, my blood pressure shot up, my pulse shot up, and folks, no exaggeration, I literally felt faint. I was literally, physically reliving that moment in that church. Now, in the past 35 years, I've had a lot of experience as an a-hole whisperer. <laughs> I thought in that moment of all of the eviscerating things I might have said to those two guys, literally wishing that I could go back in time and defend myself. But these were mean old men back then. They're probably dead now. As my friend Dan likes to say, if you sit quietly by the riverside long enough, you'll see the bodies of your enemies float by. <laughs> but the larger truth is, I don't have a score to settle with those two jerks. They mean nothing to me. They have no power to insult me or to hurt me unless I go back to that moment in my memory, go back to that incident, and literally empower these two now deceased men to rob me of my joy, to make me miserable, 
to haunt me like ghosts from a toxic church past. But, and this is sincerely not an overstatement, the stress that we embody through memory can cause heart disease, it can make you a diabetic, it can literally shorten your life. In the worst cases, it can kill you. Now, his theology is typically pretty labored, but C.S. Lewis, I think, had great insight into people and relationships. Lewis cautioned his readers, you can't go back and change the beginning, but you can start where you are and change the ending. We don't have the ability to undo past mistakes, bad decisions, ill-advised love relationships, friendships, or, or even career moves, but we can start where we are today and change the outcome of the future. The title of my sermon today is uh, a quote that's falsely attributed to Voltaire, though to be fair, it was a comment made by someone writing about the theme of Voltaire's Candide. And he said, life is a shipwreck, but we must remember to sing in the lifeboats. And I don't want you to hear that as trite. Voltaire probably would have, but I don't want you to hear it that way. It echoes the famous line that Scott Peck uses to start his, his book, The Road Less Traveled. Life is full of suffering, but as soon as you accept that fact, it no longer matters. Most love relationships do not last. Most people have no idea how to sustain a meaningful friendship. You can eat healthy foods, exercise, live like a saint, and you will still die. Many of us here, in this church in particular, are plagued with an excessive awareness of the chaos going on in politics and world events. Even those who celebrate the long-delayed consideration of impeaching our Clementine Caligula must be aware that no matter how necessary that might be, that the process of doing it is going to be quite chaotic. It's going to be divisive. It's going to create probably a year of really painful anguish. The stock market will respond. It'll go up and down like a roller coaster. The crime rate may even spike uh, as we move into a chaotic time that is likely to last right up until the 2020 presidential election. Folks, the truth is, in many ways, life is a shipwreck. But along the way, even if it's not permanent, you have to kind of give up the idea of permanence. Along the way, we will experience love. We will experience friendships. There is joy. Sure, sometimes you're the bug, but some days you're the windshield. We, we, have to, we have to relish the fact that this shipwreck of a life is decorated by moments of joy and love and friendship. Don't be sad that it's over. Be glad that it happened at all. Prayer is a matter then of consciously choosing to forgive the people who have wounded you, the people that abandoned you. The people who lied about you, the ones who stabbed you in the back, or the ones that just walked away. Prayer is choosing nobility over revenge. In meditation, we're not trying to deny reality or to shut it out. We acknowledge it, but we find the honesty and the courage to decisively move through the crises of life. As, as uh, Niebuhr famously prayed, we want to find the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to th change the things that I can, and the wisdom to be able to tell the difference. Or sometimes, the courage to change the things I simply cannot accept, or at least the knowledge to know where to hide the bodies. I think that, <laughs> I think that as I said, one of the reasons that the Christian religion has survived and dominated so much of modern history is not what it taught about sacraments or divine human uh, incarnations and things, but, but, it, but it teaches practices of forgiveness, 
of peacefulness, of kindness, of empathy, of compassion, and piety. With or without a supernatural theistic deity, a dying and rising savior or sacraments, forgiveness, compassion, prayer are sustaining and life-giving habits that benefit all of us. The Buddhist philosopher Alan Watts said, you do not sing a song to get to its end. The point being that we have to learn to love the process of living, even in the hard times. Almost all of us in graduate school were fighting to get to graduation. And it wasn't until I got my fourth piece of sheepskin that I was able to look back and realize that we had not put our life on hold while we were grinding through those assignments and writing papers and earning credits. Learning itself is a thing to be relished. Regardless of grades and credits and degrees, the process itself, we were alive in graduate school even when it didn't feel like it. When I was younger, I was a runner, and I used to run too many marathons a year. I ran one in the spring and one in the fall, and I trained all year long to run the best mini marathon that I could, always knowing that I was going to end up at the back of the pack. No matter how hard I trained or how hard I practiced, if there were 5,000 people running in the race, I would be after number 4,000. But I never went out thinking I was going to win the race. It wasn't about the finish line. It was about sharing that two hours of running, which for some people was an hour and 10 minutes, but for me, it was two hours of running. And if I managed to run 13 miles, in my own mind, I was a winner. I didn't even bother looking up to see who would place first and second or third because it didn't matter to me. It wasn't about them. It was about the experience I had with the sore knees and bleeding and chafing and sometimes running in the, in the heat or in the cold or in the rain, but I finished and felt exhilarated by having participated in it. Now, I get a lot of the same effect by climbing two flights of stairs these days, but <laughs> everything in its season, right? Again, not to be trite about losses, but we allow ourselves to be tormented by the end of a love relationship or a friend that no longer wants to associate with us or the end of a career, or even the end of your own health. But you can also choose to be happy about having had those experiences at all. Being in love is sometimes like a beautiful fall day. You can't stop time. You can't store the day in a jar. You live fully in the moment, try to be grateful for it, knowing all the while that winter will eventually show up. Depression comes from dwelling on the past. Anxiety comes from worrying about the future. Joy doesn't exist anywhere except in the present moment. Joy is never in the past. It is never in the future. It is either right now or it isn't. Having an active prayer life should allow us to focus on the present moment, actively choosing not to sacrifice our present on the altar of bad memories or future conflicts. Not to wade too deeply into the woods, but the addiction many young people have to playing video games and the addiction many adults have to gambling is related to this matter of living in a present moment. An interactive video game allows an anxiety-riddled teenager to let go of the rest of the world and to become immersed in a game that demands 100% of their focus and attention on what is happening right now. An unhappy adult can go to a casino and depression and resentment fade away as they're staring at the next card that's turned up on the table or the next spin of the slot machine, never anticipating anything in the future farther than where this is gonna end. The problem comes when the money runs out or the game ends and then suddenly the past and the anxiety about the future reasserts itself. I'm just saying the better way is to be aware of your depression, your anxiety, your fear, so that you have the ability to consciously reject it. The popular Vietnamese Buddhist teacher Thich Nhat Hanh emphasizes in meditation instruction that your whole life 
is in the present moment. And wouldn't it be a shame to miss that? You can miss out on your entire life by being depressed about the past or being anxious about the future. Your mind is very powerful, and when you dwell on past pain, depression can become your constant companion. You all know how much I, I love and respect the work of Soren Kierkegaard, but Kierkegaard wrote in his journal, he literally personified his depression. He said, my depression has been my most faithful mistress. Is it any wonder that I return her affection? As much as I have adored his work, you can't really respect that, to acquiesce to your depression. Any more than you can respect someone who suffers from psychosomatic illnesses but holds on to them because that they believe that being sick is how they get attention or it makes them somehow more interesting. One of my very southern aunts used to comment on some of the church ladies we knew, well, Roger, you know Karen, Karen is enjoying ill health right now. <laughs> Kierkegaard himself was the product of an affair between his father and the housekeeper. His father more or less blamed Soren for his mere existence, and I'm sure that his childhood was unspeakably miserable. But as Jung said, you are not what has happened to you. You are who you choose to become through what has happened to you. Now, we are going to be living in turbulent times for the next several months. All the while, our environment is being destroyed. Militarism is causing massive casualties. Millions are being turned into refugees. And this spending is impoverishing the world. The wealth gap is still growing. And politicians are so lost in their own corruption, they're not doing a damn thing to help us. Life, in many ways, is a shipwreck. I'm just begging you to keep singing in the lifeboats. There's no way to avoid the hardships that are on the horizon, but there is no one who can keep us from dancing and singing as we forge ahead. As Emerson said, he is rich who owns the day, but no one owns the day who allows it to be invaded with fret and anxiety. Finish every day and be done with it. You have done what you could, some blunders and absurdities, no doubt crept in. Forget them as soon as you can. Tomorrow is a new day. Begin it well and serenely, with too high a spirit to be cumbered with your old nonsense. This new day is too dear, with its hopes and invitations, to waste a moment on yesterday's. Broken hearts will eventually get better, though, honestly, they're apt to be broken again. Some friendships will fail, though we have reason to believe that there'll be new ones. Men and women, one day, Donald Trump will no longer be president of the United States. And on that day, the news will have to go back into journalism and actually try to report on what's going on. But after Donald Trump is out of the White House, there will always be another despot, another political disappointment, another cause to fight for around the corner. We needn't kid ourselves about that. We will always have reason to get out of bed, dust, dust ourselves off, and ferociously face the challenges that are ahead of us. Garrison Keillor once said that when the country goes temporarily to the dogs, cats have to learn to walk on fences sleep in trees, and have faith that all this woofing is not the last word. When Trump is gone, we will still be here. So let us sing and dance and not merely survive. Thank you for watching our videos. We are entirely dependent on the donations of our listeners and members. We hope that you find this content to be important enough to help us to keep offering these videos to the public at no charge by becoming a regular contributor. Please click on the donate button on our website at www.spfccc.org. Thank you for your support of progressive religious programming.